Hello and welcome back to a late night, last minute edition of State of the Division. This time we're bringing in UFC 296 and the last card of the year. Overall, it's pretty interesting, I'm willing to say. It's had a bit of a rough time getting started, but I think overall we have some interesting fights, two title fights for fun divisions that always produce good matches. Col Colby Covington is always a sight to behold on cards and media nights. So jumping right in, let's get on with the housekeeping. On that last card, I went six and six with a draw that I refused to count against myself, which does bring my record on the year to 87 and 63. Not half bad, if I'm willing to say so myself, although I did miss a card in there. Now, the other part of housekeeping, Butcher's Bill. This card has had a rough go. We have lost Brown and Sali We've lost Randy Rudeboy Brown off with Muslim Sal Salikov. I'm so sorry. Uh, that was dropped after Brown was unable to fight due to some other reason. He had to withdraw, so that fight is off the card. Giga Chikadze was originally supposed to fight Josh Emmett. Giga Chikadze had to pull out. Josh Emmett now fights Bryce Mitchell. Ian Gary and, by extension, Vincent Luque were both supposed to fight on this card at well. Last minute, as in today, before I came home to finish the script, Ian Gary pulled out. Don't know why. Doctor said he couldn't. Joke on Reddit is that we bullied him out of it. Either way, Ian Gary is not fighting. By extension, Vincent Luque does not have a fight, though he has called out Kevin Holland. And if that fight does come to pass, I'm going to call it for Holland now out of pure favoritism, and I will count it against me if I get it wrong. The new beginning of the card is 13-1. Martin Badis Boudet, looking to keep his UFC record perfect against the true perfect 11-0, Shamil Gaziev. I'm so sorry. Bidet sits a year younger, either two or none inches taller, with Geziev taking a single inch in reach. Bidet is riding a hot streak so far in the UFC, and in that streak he's been very much a heavyweight. A 5.62 to 5.40 average in striking with one KO win in the UFC and seven total in his career. He does tend to get stuck in close slugging fights, or even getting surpassed in his fight with Brzezecki. And he does have a submission win and a .0 takedown average, but I feel confident saying that that's not part of his greater game as a heavyweight. Gaziev is the newcomer here, and outside the UFC, he is very much has resembled the classical heavyweight. Seven KO wins, three submission wins. Don't have a whole lot on him, but I can say he has gone the distance at least once, and has been able to go into the second round before. Now, Vegas gives it to Bidet, and I'm going to agree, given his experience, given his time in the UFC, given the good slugging performances, I say slugging, good striking performances he's put on so far. Again, his opponent doesn't have a whole lot for me to look at, um, so in the end, I'm going to run with Bidet kind of based on Vegas and the fact that we've seen him give decent striking performances, heavyweight style, in the UFC so far. 22, 10, 0, oh, and 1, Andre, touchy-feely, looks for a return to the win column against the 14 and 2, Lucas Almeida. Almeida is a year younger, two inches taller, but does surrender a whopping three in reach. Touchy's all over the place, in all honesty. He rocks a 3 8 3 to 4 one, three in striking and hasn't really had the KO touch as of late. Uh, he struggled with taking damage and overall avoiding getting hit, with his only striking leads in his last eight fights coming in a no contest and win over Shaman Moraes. And there really isn't a ground game backing it up, despite the 2.22 average. He is able to pull some control time without takedowns, but even then it hasn't been enough to get him a win in several of his more recent fights. Almeida has also been struggling, but does come across a little more kill or be killed, though it has been more killed as of late. He rocks a 529 to 529 in striking and a cool 0, 0.00 takedown out. Who does have five pure submission wins, so that is a threat. Favorite here is Feely, and in this battle of I really don't knows, I will agree. I think Almeida has an uphill battle, because even though his takedown average hasn't been great, he's been getting takedowns, which can equate to control time against somebody who's really been struggling on the ground, and while they are a submission threat, I don't imagine Feely's going to hang down there long enough or hang down in a position where he is in danger. He does have some repertoire with avoiding submissions and being confident on the ground, something I think is going to give him the benefit over Almeida here. 14-2, and Tagir Ulunobekov. I'm so sorry. Takes the ring against 16-4-1, Cody Durden. Even age across the board with either even or two or even three inches going to Durden because UFC and Sherdog are 
seven miles off on everything, but I can say three inches definitively do go to Ulan Obanekov. Ulan comes across as a ground-focused fighter with the ability to finish, but also more than willing just to grind it. On that note, he rocks a 3.81 takedown average, and in every fight that's gone more than one round, he's racked up at least two takedowns and about four minutes of control time. In striking, he carries the functional 3.35, 3.29, and while you've seen him take a lead in striking, he also seems just to set up his ground game consistently. Durden's remarkably similar with a takedown heavy style, 5.4 one takedown average and the ability to hold control time pretty well. Striking is okay, 3.13 to 2.94, and once again is really just functional at best. He does have a KO win, but that seems like the odd duck and not so much the consistent through threat. Vegas has decided to pick Olenbenekov by a narrow margin, and I will disagree. It's a close fight, I have to admit, and I'm giving it to Durden here. Um, Olenbenekov is dangerous with submissions, so he'll be dangerous on the ground, and he has that functional striking. But Durden's got the same functional striking. I think Durden has the higher takedown aggression. And his ability to hold control time is either equal to or the same as. So I'm going to give it to the person that pushes the pace with takedowns more. So in the end, I think that slight striking defense. And I think the almost equal ability to have control time plus his ability to push takedowns gives him a slight edge. Ending off these early prelims, or maybe not at this point with the fights we've lost, 14-3-1, and one, Atomic Alonzo Menefield looks to put another in the win column against 19-7-1, and one, Dustin Dahaniak Jacoby. I think I said that right. Jacoby is one year younger, while also taking three to four inches in height, with dead even reach across the board. Menefield is a finisher, and while he doesn't always get it, he always seems to be pushing for it in almost all of his fights. Striking is definitely his highlight, with a 382 to 309, and power in spades to put people away quick. In addition to power, he is able to take leads in some fights with his striking, but oftentimes he'll just try to slug it out or hang in the phone booth with him. In addition, he does have some decent variety. Takedown average, however, sits at a .62 and really doesn't seem like a consistent part of his game. Instead, it's more of a recovery or an eruption tactic, not something he's relying on too heavily. Jacoby's a very similar fighter, I feel. 5-4-6 to 4 2 in striking, in addition to that kill or be killed kind of style. That being said, he has been neutralized before against takedowns, and other aggressive strikers have taken the lead on him and put him away with their style. Styles. Does have a .4 takedown average, but once again really shows up as only response or recovery. Vegas picked Jacoby, and I'm gonna pick against. This is a bit of a gut feeling. The math isn't quite there for Menafield at this point, but he's riding a hot hand. I think this is a bit of a trap fight with Menafield. His willingness to stand on the feet and go with you puts you in danger of getting hit with his power. And while Jacoby hasn't really been put away all that much, I think Menafield's the type of fighter that will trap him in this. They're going to go into the feet, and I think Menafield has a slight edge in terms of power there. Kicking off our prelims, I think. 9-1, Casey King O'Neill looks for the rebound against 16-8, Harian, Queen of Violence, Lipsky. Sorry if I said that. King is three years younger, with even height, and two of reach going to O'Neal. O'Neal only has five UFC fights total, but has gone four and one so far. And on that note, I would call her a finisher, so far. But total, she has three KO, two submission, and four decision wins in her career. So I don't really know what to call her, but numbers-wise, she rolls an 877 to 590 in striking, and does have the ability to put people away, two of her four wins coming that way. Also worth noting is the fact that those wins, she landed a majority on ground and pound, so obviously the takedowns do need to get mixed in there, especially solid with a 1.96 average. But also the ability to control time without takedowns helps make her even more dangerous. Lipsky, on the other hand, works with a 3.94 to 4.20 in strength. Though she doesn't seem to have a great deal of KO power in the UFC with zero so far in the promotion, she also doesn't seem to take striking leads often, instead just hanging in and relying on her takedowns to grind and get control. And despite only having a .54 average, she has been able to use them effectively recently while also getting control time without takedowns as well. Now the favorite is O'Neal by a narrow margin, and I will agree. While on paper the numbers definitely lean O'Neal's way, they are somewhat overinflated by only having five UFC fights so far. That being said, I think O'Neal does have the edge in striking. Her performances have looked better so far, and while this fight likely is going to end up going to the ground, as both fighters seem to be comfortable there, I think there O'Neal will be able to survive or take control on the ground, which does put the ball kind of in her court, because I think she is the better striker. And while Lipsky's going to want to go to the ground, if O'Neal can match or survive and get back to the feet, I think the ball hangs with her. 13-5, and five, Cody Nolove Garbrandt looks for two in a row against 24-14, and 14, Brian Boom Keller. Garbrandt is five years younger, as well as two or one inch taller, with one inch in reach heading Keller's way. Now, Garbrandt is a striker, rocking a three flat to 389 in striking, 
And I will say those numbers are dragged a great deal by his two most recent losses, where the difference of strike was pretty bad. That being said, he does have a pretty good style of striking, making use of movement to get in close, hit, and dip out. He's also been working in takedowns more recently, especially in his fights against Rob Font and Trevin Jones, and has now carries a 1.13 average. Keller, more of a grinder, 1.79 takedown average, and the ability to stack takedowns at times. Six against whoever Kroom is, and three against Pilarte. That being said, some, some opponents are able to reverse the ground game onto him and sink submissions. Now, with that being his focus, the striking is simply serviceable, 3-3-6 to 4-6-1. Basically good enough to hang in and let him set up his ground game. The favorite is Garbrandt, and I will agree. Keller's striking defense isn't great, and while he is good at takedowns and good at hanging in there, I'm kind of giving Garbrandt the benefit of the doubt that he'll be able to either defend a takedown, survive on the ground long enough to get back to the feet and dominate there. Could Keller win on the ground? Yes, but I'm just simply giving Garbrandt the benefit of he'll be able to at least stuff a takedown or two and keep it where he wants to have this fight. 14 and 7, Irene Aldana tries to get back to winning against 17 and 5, Carol Rosa. Rosa is seven years younger, either two or four inches shorter, with one inch in reach going back to Aldana. Aldana comes in as a striker with some finishability hanging in the wind. Numbers wise, she hangs with a 486 to 571, which does speak to her tendency to win close and lose big in the numbers. 41 to 142 against Nunez, and a 37 to 39 win over Jason. As mentioned, she has finishability mixed in with a variety of strikes that do she does utilize very well. The ground game is another facet she can use, but admittedly hasn't as of late with a 0.17 average there. Rose is a bit more rounded with a 5.43 to 4.17 in striking backed up with a 1.38 takedown average. Her fights do tend to be a little odd, some of her wins having her outstruck 95 to 66 with one takedown and then winning 54 to 36 with three takedowns. She does seem to adjust her setup and approach in these fights. Now, to be fair, those were split and majority decision fights, so expect it to be close and expect it to be a little odd. Now Vegas likes Aldana, but they have it close, which makes sense. And I'm gonna run with Rosa. I think Rosa has that awkward kind of style that puts a lot of things in her court. And if she is capable and has proven herself good enough to take the advantage in several cases, I think her ground game as well as functional striking give her a slight edge here over Aldana. And while Aldana can keep her on the feet and definitely rock her, if it goes to the ground, I'm gonna give it to Rosa, whose kind of specialty is grinding these fights away. Now, I still believe this is ending off the prelims, but this might be on the main card now. 18 and 4, Josh Emmett squares up with 16 and 1, Bryce Thug Nasty Mitchell. Mitchell is 9 years younger, 3 or 4 inches taller, with no difference in reach. Now, Emmett is someone I would call a striker, but that grinding type of striking where they just kind of hang on the feet and just go to war against their opponent. 407, a 466 backs that up, as well as his ability to manifest knockdowns while not going down himself. I will say that his variety and power aren't the greatest as of late, but he does some degree of power haunting in the wings. At least enough to keep you honest. Also carries a .92 takedown average, but it does read as more recovery or disruption over a consistent game plan. Mitchell, the replacement here, is very much a ground focused fighter with a 3.51 average and the ever present takedown threat. Additionally, he has the ability to stack takedowns with regularity and and rack up a great deal of control time off of them. Striking is fine for how he fights, a 2-3-4 to 1 6, 4, but it exists to get him to the ground and help him set up submissions, which he is capable of doing almost at will. He is one of the fighters that have a twister submission. Vegas likes Mitchell, and this gives me pause. Emmett almost always hangs in fights, and while I feel that he, that could help him and let him get the upset, I have to say Mitchell's takedowns, his tenacity with them, and the constant submission threat, that gives him the edge in my mind. I'm going to run with Mitchell. 25 and 9, Tony El Kakui Ferguson looks to stop the skid against 20 and 3, Patty the Batty Pimblet. Pimblet is 11 years younger with either 1 or 2 inches in height going to Tony, as well as 3 inches in reach. Well, Tony Ferguson is Tony Ferguson, and I can end the segment there. Being honest though, he is, he very much sits as a striker capable of controlling the fight on the feet with dynamic striking and a great variety. In addition to, the, uh, in addition to that, he packs some KO power behind his punches. However, this is what he is capable of and not what he has done recently especially with a six-fight losing streak. Current numbers reflect the current state of things. A 498 to 426 in striking and a .42 takedown average. They do help show the current issues with getting outpaced on the feet and struggling against takedowns and control time being used on him. But the Benil Dariush fight comes to mind. Pimlet is a bit of a different story, currently undefeated in the UFC and a bit more ground focused than Ferguson. A .97 takedown average with an additional measure of submission threat thrown in at any real chance. Striking wise carries a 419 to 348, which isn't amazing, but he's proven to be good enough to match competition, even pull out KO power. Vegas likes Pimlet, and as much as I love Tony Ferguson, as much as I think he'll put on a good fight, I have to agree. Tony hasn't looked great. 
He's done a lot to get mentally prepared for this fight, and I think it'll make a difference in how he fights. But I have to say that I think Pimblet is the hot hand. Pimblet is coming in off a streak. Pimblet is coming in here, and I think Tony is on the be I think Tony's on the skid here. 17 and another Shavakat Nomad Rakhmanov. I'm so sorry. Looks to stay perfect against 17, 6, and 1. Steven, Wonder Boy Thompson. Rakhmanov is 11 years younger, 1 inch taller, with 2 inches in reach, also heading his way. Rakhmanov has shown to be a finisher so far in the UFC, with a definite preference for the ground game. 1.49 take time average, with 4 submission wins since 2020. Not to mention that those submissions came in different rounds, which proven that his endurance can carry the fight into can carry that submission threat into later rounds. With the striking, he racks a 4-4-5 to a 2-6-1, and has also proven some finishing power. But part of that disparity is the fact he also will take a lead and quickly submit his opponent afterward. I'm talking like 21-6 to in a first round submission. Uh, even then, he's shown the ability to control other striking heavy fighters on the feet and do well there. Thompson, speaking of strikers, is a striker through and through, who makes great use of the basics with a solid style and the ability to manage his opponents pretty well. Rolls with a 4-2-0 to 3-0-4 in striking, and while the KO power isn't always there, he occasionally can get it with great timing and uh, overwhelming his opponent, not so much pure power. Takedown game and defense both aren't great with a .27 and 64% respectively, and with heavy takedown fighters, he has been controlled and dominated before. Vegas likes Rakhmonov, and if I said that wrong, I'm sorry, but I have to agree. Thompson is a good fighter, but Thompson's a striking heavy fighter, and he has struggled against takedown heavy guys of four, guys that can pick you up, put you down, and just control you on the ground. And Rachmonov is capable of doing that. And while Rachmonov might not outclass him on the feet, Rachmonov has shown the ability to manage good strikers on the feet and either get them to the ground or get them in a position that he can throw a submission. And I think that gives Rachmonov the edge here. For the first title fight of the night, Alexander the Cannibal Pantoa looks to defend his belt against a familiar face. 15 and 6, Brandon, Raw Dog Royval. Feel dirty just saying that. Rival is two years younger, either two or four inches taller, with one inch in reach, also rolling his way. Pantoa is a bit of an all-rounder with a dangerous finishing ability on both the ground and feet, with eight career KO wins and ten submission wins. On the feet, he rocks a 4-4-1 to 3-8-1, with a high-octane motor and the tendency to push the pace, not to mention the variety he can pull. I will say that his KO power hasn't popped up recently, but I will say it is still there. Backing that up and giving him the versatility that I like a lot is the 175 take takedown average that enables him to switch pace when he's being beat on the feet, able to take the fight to the ground and control it there. Now, he can go the distance, but a good chunk of his fights do end early, and Royval is similar, at least in the high octane going for the finish idea. But the difference shows up in the numbers, with a 3-4-5 to 2.63 in striking with good variety as well. However, there are fights where he gets into the thick of it, but he can pull his ground game there to nail submission. Does only have a 0.66 take, takedown average, but he's able to capitalize off knockdowns and misplays from his opponents to sink those in as well. Vegas likes Pantoa, and I will agree. Aside from making me eat my words last time I picked against him, I like his aggressiveness, and while Red Bull can match, Philip Pantoa is better on the feet, and if it goes to the ground, I think he's good enough to survive or reverse and take control of Royval, which means that I think he'll be able to at least nullify the strongest part of Royval's game and maybe accentuate the best part of his game, his striking, I feel. And the main event, 21-3, Leon, Rocky Edwards, looks to keep his belt against the challenger, 17-3, Colby, Chaos, Covington. Edwards is three years younger, either one or three inches taller, with two in reach, also going his way. Edwards has made me eat my words and has done so as a very solid, well-rounded grinder. He does have KO ability, but in the wider scale of things, he, come across, he comes across as that way more. His striking shows that with a 280 to 2.40, and he is able to take the lead, but oftentimes sits close with his opponents and makes the difference with a 1.26 takedown app. His wrestling is very much game plan and opponent base that have ever present, but it's great at disruption and getting him control time when needed. Overall, he's able to hold down the fort in both aspects of the game. Covington isn't as much of an all-rounder, but he's able to handle himself on the feet and do well on the ground. Striking, he rocks a 4-1-0 to 3-0-5, and while he normally is able to take the striking lead, there are times where he can absolutely be run over by his opponents with more power or the ability to stuff his takedowns. And on the subject of takedowns, he rolls with a 4-0-5 and the ability to rack them up almost on will which gives him the control time and the option to ground and pound his opponents, which he has done. Now, the favorite is Edwards by a narrow margin, and I understand why. Edwards had close fights with Usman, and Edwards is coming into this with a not lackluster wrestling background, but wrestling doesn't look as good as Kobe's takedowns. In the end, I'm going to agree with Vegas, and I'm going to pick Edwards. Edwards has made me eat crow before, as well as I think Edwards' ability to adjust and kind of just 
be good enough in every aspect will enable him to at least hang in with Kobe on the ground or even turn it against him. And I think on the feet, he's good enough to match and keep pace with Kobe, who can get a little wild and go into slugfest, which he did with Usman twice, really. Now, that being said, that is UFC 296. It's an interesting card. It's not a great card. And the injuries sure as hell ain't helping. But overall, I think this is an interesting fight card. We'll have two pretty, we should have two good championship bouts. We have some interesting contender eliminations or contender prove it fights. Bryce Mitchell with a win. I think he rocket back, rockets back into contention. Patty with a win. I think starts putting his name into the mix with a big one like that, at least to the UFC. Uh, losing Ian Gary kind of sucks. I think that that would have been a proven. The wrist of Sabota. Good pressure there. Good back of the head pressure from Leon Not Edwards. 10 seconds. Just given my love for that division, but I think that'll be an interesting fight. The winner, I think we can start looking at him to take on somebody towards the end of the rankings, whoever number 13 is at this point. But overall, UFC 296, love it or hate it, it's the last card of the year. We've made it through another year. Uh, go ahead and leave your opinions in the comments. Love this card, hate this card, love my analysis, hate my analysis. Do as you will. Thank you for watching. Have a great fight.